Um, since 2005, has been president of Remember My Service Productions, the only company in the country to work with the military commands to help them tell their story by integrating all their digital content into books, interactive ebooks, and short documentaries. RMS works with the Department of Defense to produce the decree to produce the Korean War 60th commem commemorative book and feature documentary, which was selected for the GI Film Festival in 2014 in Washington, D.C. In support of the troops, Ms. Hawks has traveled to forward operating bases in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, pulled 7.5 Gs in, a, in an F-16, and spent time aboard the aircraft carrier USS Vinson to better understand the service provided by our dedicated service members. She was recently appointed by the Secretary of Defense to be a member of the Defense Advisory Council on Women in the Service, is a board member in the Utah Defense Alliance, an executive committee, mem committee member for Association of the U.S. Army, Utah Region, and is co-chair of, of the AMAR Foundation, working in mid Middle East conflict areas. In 2008, she founded Gratitude Project Gratitude, an annual program that brings wives and daughters to fallen heroes to complimentary VIP weekend in the Miss America finals, where they are recognized as honorary Miss Americas in a ceremony on the Miss America stage. Miss Hawks holds a bachelor degree in communications from BYU and a master's degree in integrated marketing communication from the University of Utah. After college, she signed with ESPN and spent 16 years as an award-winning sports sportscaster there covering world-class events such as the World Cup Soccer, World Cup Skiing, the Kentucky Derby, the French Open, and Big Ten College Football from 1990 to 1995. She was a host of College Game Day, World Cup Soccer Today, Scholastic Sports America, ESPN Sailing, and Great American Events. In her role as both producer and on-air talent, Ms. Hawks has interviewed such, such celebrities as Peyton Manning, Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, Larry King, Jackie Jonier Kersey, Donald Trump, Diego Maradona, Tony Bennett, Mary Lou Retton, Troy Aikman, Ger George Strait, and even Alice Cooper. Ms. Hawks was born in Paraguay, later living in Ecuador, Chile, Mexico, but mo spent most of her teenage years in Buenos Aires, Argentina. She is only the only foreign-born Miss America in 1985 and, has and is an accomplished musician and published author. Ms. Hawks and her husband Bob have four children and live in Centerville, Utah, where they enjoy skiing, biking, and camping. And we'll turn the time over to you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. I'm getting used to this microphone. I brought my show and tell. Am I getting feedback now? So, okay, so tell me where I can and can't stand on here. Is this okay if I'm over here? I'm gonna find the light. Okay, now am I out of the shadows? Good to see all of you guys. This sounds really loud. I'm used to like talking really loud. Um, in fact, do you guys know who Chris Berman is? Okay, for those of you who watch ESPN. So Chris Berman was around when, when I was there and Chris Berman is known as Boomer back at ESPN. That's kind of his nickname and they called me Baby Boomer. That was my nickname, because I can get really loud. So I won't, I won't blow you out, I promise. It's so great to be here. I love Utah State. I've got my, my second daughter is graduating from here next month. And if she didn't have a class in Salt Lake City tonight, she would have been here. So I'm sad I couldn't introduce you to her. Um, my daughter, Nicole, and then my, my youngest, um, he's looking at coming here too. So we're gonna come up here for a visit. So what do you guys think, should he come? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, I will tell him you said so. But it is just fun to be here. What I'm gonna do first is tell you what I'm doing right now, the biggest stuff on my plate that I'm so excited about. Then I'm gonna walk you back a little bit and kind of tell you how I got there personally and professionally. And then I'm gonna share with you some lessons learned, okay? So just kind of three categories. Um, I'm gonna pull some things out here so that way I've got, I've got my show and tell ready. I tell you what, I only do backpacks now. I used to do, try to do the briefcase thing and look really professional. And I decided, ah, that was really hard on my back. So backpacks actually, so much better. So I'm gonna kind of show you some stuff. Um, let me get it out here for just a second. Okay, now it's ready to go. That's all I need. So, remember my service productions 
is the project coordinator on behalf of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, the Veterans um, of Foreign Wars, the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, and the Naval Historical Foundation. We are producing the Vietnam War 50th commemorative gift that will be presented to 7.4 million Vietnam veterans over the course of the next three years because 2015 to 2017 are the peak years of the 50th commemorative uh, period to recognize our Vietnam veterans. Why is this so important? And I will tell you, for those of you who were probably born just 20 years ago or something like that, because it, it was something that I had to learn um, as I grew up, because I was born in 1964. So the height of the Vietnam years were more like 67, you know, through 71, 72. Um, but that was one of the most idiotic um, tragic times in our American history of how we treated our returning troops coming home in uniform and yet the way that we treated them, I don't recognize that America at all. And if you look back in your history books, you'll find out what they would do. They would come home in airports, out on the street. If they were in uniform, they would get spit on. And I talked to somebody not two weeks ago who told me about a good friend of his who was coming home from Vietnam, survived Vietnam, and was shot and killed in San Francisco. That's the kind of America they were coming home to, which, you know what, I don't recognize that America, but I do recognize the America today that does know how to thank and recognize our troops, right? They come home, we clap for them, regardless of how we feel about the policies of war, right? So that's why this Vietnam 50th commemoration is so key, and I am so proud that we are the ones, my company, are the ones that are heading this commemoration um, up in terms of the commemorative gift that's going to be presented to all those 7.4 million Vietnam veterans. As you might imagine, it's a really big project, 7.4 million of them. And how are we going to do that? I am really excited to share with you that we also partnered with the National Association of State Directors of Veterans Affairs. And I just briefed them two weeks ago in Washington, D.C., all the State Directors of Veterans Affairs, and I got to tell them how we were going to roll this out with every single state, that they're going to have their own customized state version of the commemorative gift that will be a hardbound book, about 160 pages, with an interactive ebook and a feature documentary, and we're digitizing all the Vietnam era division magazines so that they can have access to it. Every single veteran getting this as a thank you. Because right now, guess what they're getting? They're getting stickers. I should have brought one. Um, I, went to, I went to this one event where they had this big Vietnam thank you, and they were given a sticker. Thank you, a sticker. No, these people, we lost you know, 50,000 lives. We, this was not something, you know, when you think about what we lost, um, during Iraq and Afghanistan, not even what about 7,000 total over you know any life is is a tragedy to lose. But um, so anyway, this is really an important period in American history. 50 years later, to say thank you. Um, so we have partnered with with all of these these groups to make this happen, and in every state to roll it out. And guess what? I'm even even. Um, as excited to, to be able to announce to you that Utah is the first state in the country to establish the public and private partnership that will take care of the funding. In fact, two weeks ago, I got to stand on the floor of the U.S. Senate as, it, as a bill was unanimously passed to cover the funding for this commemorative gift for our 47,000 Vietnam veterans here in Utah. And it's a matching gift with the private sector here in Utah. So, and on Monday, this coming Monday, the governor's gonna sign that into law. This is the first state, and I already have 20 other states. Kentucky is, um, Kentucky is one, Michigan, Illinois, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Idaho, anyway, a bunch of them, Mississippi. Um, I've got 20, what I call early adopter states that are already on board to do exactly what Utah's done. So Utah has been the leader, uh, once again, as we are in many things, on that. So that's what I'm doing right now. The biggest thing on my plate our core competency for my company has been for the last 10 years is telling the story of military command. So for instance, um, the reason why we're the experts actually at um, what we're doing for the Vietnam project is because a year and a half ago, we completed this project, 160 page book, working together with the Department of Defense and the Republic of Korea, that's South Korea. Sometimes people will say, was that North Korea? No, South Korea. Um, and we got to be in the middle 
of the development of this. Can you imagine a little tiny company? I've only got 17 employees in Salt Lake City working back and forth, sending manuscripts to the Department of Defense and then the Republic of Korea back and forth. And any time they changed one word, we had to send it over to the Pentagon and they would change a word and send it back to Korea. Boy, was that fun. Um, but this was 250,000 copies of these went to Korean War veterans in every single state nationwide to thank them for their service. Um, this was fully funded by the Federation of Korean Industries, Hyundai, Samsung, LG, to thank our veterans and the government of Korea. They wanted to pay for this and say thank you. In fact, so this, whole, this tells the story of what Korea did with that seed of freedom to say, um, you know, to become one of the most powerful economies in the world. So right here in the front, this is a message from the president of Korea, Mrs. Park, to say thank you to our veterans. That's how much they value our veterans. This was so successful. And then we did a documentary, that, a feature documentary that was selected for the GI Film Festival. So that was the gift that they got. And after that, and the reaction from those veterans to something substantive that told their story, that's why we're, we're doing that. Okay, so now our core competency, I'll show this to you really fast, is, so we're actually a technology company. And we specialize in digital content management, but we got pulled in to help the military tell their story. And the more we did it, we were doing CD-ROMs. This is back in 2005, 2006. CD-ROMs, and then we went to DVD-ROMs, and then dual-layer DVD-ROMs, which everybody thought was really cool, and 10,000 digital pages, we put everything on it. And now we've moved to um, interactive e-books. Everybody wants the, the shareability uh, factor. But guess what I learned along the way? As intent as we were on technology, people want tangible stuff. They want it on their tables. This is the Utah Air National Guard. Um, there are pictures of their units in there. So they have the ebook and they have this. 7,000 Guard members got this, this um, two months ago. As a thank you for your service, here's what you did. This is um, an amphibious assault ship, the USS Peleliu. Every, oops, that's falling out. Every sailor was in here. The 125th Striker Brigade Combat Team. So this is what we do, we preserve here, I'll talk like this. No. We preserve their history. And then we archive it with the Center of Military History, with the Army Historical Foundation, the Naval Historical Foundation, Library of Congress, um, everybody. And that's what we do. So as you can tell, I find it very important what I do. And I find it very um, meaningful. It's meaningful work that I am passionate about and that I believe in, and guess what? We're the only ones in the country that do this. There are, there are printers out there. There's, um, there's people that can do interactive stuff. There are people that can do video production. We're the only ones that do all of it integrated in one place as a full service for these military commands. Um, okay, so let me kind of take you back a little bit on how I got here, because trust me, when I was your age, this didn't exist, this company didn't exist. Um, I, we created this category. It never existed before we created it. Um, and when I was your age, so I was telling some of the students tonight, um, so how many of you are freshmen? Okay, so when I went in to BYU as a freshman, I was going in as a piano performance major. <laughs> and I had one lesson, and the, the piano teacher said, okay, I want you practicing five hours a day. And I went, whoa, I'm not doing five hours a day. So I changed my major. <laughs> I'm not doing piano performance. And, but it was, it was like, well, what, you know, what can I do? And I talked to my counselor and, well, let's do communications. So it just kind of, I just kind of fell into that. If you had asked me when I was your age, if I would be working at ESPN, ESPN didn't even exist. So how would I know that I want to do that? So the two biggest things that I've done in my life didn't even exist when I was your age. So that's why it's so important to just keep your minds totally open to open doors. You never know what's gonna be out there. So the important things that you should be working on are those, those key skills, the key mindsets that will allow you to take advantage of whatever opportunity might be out there that you may not have even heard of right now. So I'll take you back. So I graduated from, uh, from BYU went straight from BYU to ESPN. I was really young, um, but that's when I got my contract. Now, they were looking for women, so I was the third woman to work at ESPN. Um, it was very interesting to be one of the few there. I remember my first day walking into Sports Center, and it was like walking into a guy's locker room, and everybody just got quiet. 
<laughs> oh, there's a girl here, what do we do? Um, so it was, it was very interesting learning curve. Um, and I found early on that what I really wanted to do, they, they initially wanted me to do Sports Center, but I just didn't want a desk job. And they thought that was crazy that I didn't want to be famous and be on Sports Center and stuff. And you know what? That Miss America year cured me of that. <laughs> I didn't care about being famous or being in the spotlight. It wasn't, it wasn't something that drove me. Um, I wanted to create, I wanted to, do, I wanted to do more than just sit behind a desk and read the words that were there about the latest game. So I was actually able to get out and do all the fun things and do the World Cup soccer and, and stuff like that. Um, but I did that for seven years full time. And by then my kids were coming and it was just getting harder and harder to do stuff. And so I went off contract and then I did another nine years of freelance. So what that means would be I would probably do I don't know, three or four big events a year is all. And the rest of the time I was pretty much at home and, and I would do some speaking engagements here and there or whatever, but I, I, was, I was mostly a full-time mom. And I had, you know, my little kids were running all over the place and I would, when, during nap time, I'd work on a book project or I would do on little kind of uh, projects here and there. Then when my youngest was, um, let's see, when he was in preschool, I went back to school to get my master's. And I really wanted to get an MBA, um, but I just couldn't find a program at the U, um, which was my nearest, to, um, to fit my schedule. I wanted to do one class a semester. <laughs> That's all that I could handle with, with kids and everything, knowing that I'd probably be working on papers till 2 a.m. Um, so the University of Utah was really creative with me on working on a master's program that fit what I really wanted to do, which was in business, but uh, we got creative and I went into the communications department and did a master's in organizational communication with an emphasis in integrated marketing communication. So half my classes were actually in the School of Business. Um, so it was, it was a wonderful master's program uh, to be able to do that. So I finished that and I finished it right when my youngest got into school all day. So I knew that I could hit the ground running um, because I, and, and the big thing was that I was looking for something flexible so that I could take them to school, go to work and leave and be home by 3.30. So I, I started off with a company. Um, I was their vice president of communications. I was there for about a year and a half. This is going to be one of my lessons learned that I'll share with you later. I was there for a year and a half and realized that was not the place for me. I didn't know what was, but I just knew that that was not the scenario. Um, the, the people, I wasn't sure uh, how much I could trust them, uh, both in capability and in, you know, just uh, ethics and that kind of thing. Um, so then I, I mean, I was, I was there, but I, I kind of had my eyes open and I um, met my, my current CEO. He's the CEO of our, our uh, parent company, Story Rock is the parent company. And um, we were on a radio show together. And so we started talking and he said, um, hey, can I take you to lunch and tell you about my company? So we did and he, he started telling about the mission of Story Rock to tell the stories. Now at the time it was, it was on, um, in schools and doing the electronic yearbook and, and that kind of thing. But what I really liked was the idea that he, I asked him about his management style and, uh, and he says, oh, well, I definitely don't babysit. And I said, nice, <laughs> because I don't like to be micromanaged and I don't like to micromanage. Um, you know, I really believe in, in hiring good people and being with good people and letting them go with their ideas and, and giving them the freedom and the, the reign to, to be able to do that. And so the more I talked with him and, and he was a happy guy. And I had been around some, some people who, weren't, who were grumpy and, and I wanted happy people. So that was, that was another something that I'll share with you. Um, so I left, I left that other company and went to work for Story Rock and that was 10 years ago. And with, with my company Story Rock and with this boss, John Lund, um, who is still my boss, although he tells everybody that, that I'm his boss, which is great, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> um, we've been able to just turn on a dime on lots of different things and grab opportunities. So that's kind of, that's where I am right now. That's kind of my, my history getting up there. Now let me dive into the lessons learned. Um, and you know what, as I was kind of coming up with, okay, so really what are the things that I can latch on to it? Would you believe everything started and I did not do this intentionally. Everything started with the letter P. 
I don't know why, but you'll see. So the first one for me, people, okay, as I told you. So people really matter. I remember one of my first conversations with the president of ESPN, Steve Bornstein, when I went to work there. And uh, we were just kind of in his office, we were talking about stuff, and I said, so do you like working at ESPN? You know, here I am asking the president this. And, and I pictured, you know, he's going to games all the time. How cool is it? You get to work at ESPN, you're at the top, you get to go to all these events. And he said, Charlene, would you believe that I spend 85% of my time, maybe 90% of my time, fixing people problems. It's just people problems. And I went, but that's not fun. He goes, exactly. <laughs> he's just fixing people problems. Whether, whether this person isn't performing well enough and he's got to fix that, or these two don't get along and he's got to fix that, and it's just all this fixing. And I went, wow, is that management? Yeah, to a certain extent, yeah. There's a lot of that. That's part of the reason why I kind of started thinking, I want to work in a smaller company. Um, so I started realizing early on that if I had the choice to work for a small company or a really big company, I would choose the, the smaller company um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, not only, you know, the people and, and where, where you're working, but, um, uh, but the autonomy and um, the accountability. You actually have a lot more of it. Um, and you're not, you're, you're not micromanaged as much in a small business because you, you have to, everybody just has to pitch in and do a lot of stuff. So anyway, um, People. Uh, one of the things that I've learned is it's more important to be a connector than to be connected. Um, and by that I mean, and I think you can probably, probably guess that, the more that I can identify that um, Tom over here needs to really meet Sarah over here because they can help each other, the more that I can say, Tom, come here with me, I need you to meet Sarah, you know, because she does this business and boy, you really need that. And then they, they are able to do some stuff. I did this, I did this last year with, um, would you believe, you know, you're probably familiar with the Teamsters Union in Chicago, right? I was doing some work with them. They happened to be in DC and we were having, um, we were going to have some meetings and I said, have you guys met the veterans of foreign wars? The executive director of VFW is one of the most influential people in DC and he had never, they had never connected. They had never connected. And, and I said, how about, you know, how about if I invite Bob to come to this dinner? And they said, oh, yeah, that'd be great. So I introduced these two guys. Well, guess what? Both of them think that I'm important to them <laughs> just because I connected them, that's it. So it's not necessarily an ulterior motive, but I still find that there's more value in me being able to connect people than me just saying, oh, you know, I need, you know, will you connect me here and will you connect me here? There's, there's still ways of doing that, but I find I get a lot more value when I'm the connector with people. And it'll, no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're doing, it's all about the relationships. It really is. So that's, that's the biggie right there. Um, what about, uh, oh, I know there was something else. So, so hang on, hang on. I wanted to make sure that I don't forget something that I really wanted to share with you. Here's my notes. I just, ah, okay. So there's something else that, that having to do with people. Every time I write an email, every time I say anything, if I am on the phone, I'm thinking, do I want to keep this person? Okay, do I want to keep them in my circle? Do I want to keep them as an employee? Do I want to um, maybe someday need to work with them? And you never know, you never know. So no matter, even if you've been, even if you put a year's worth into working on a um, proposal and trying to get somebody as a client and then they, f and you've put everything into it and they still come back to you and go, we went with somebody else. You still go, that's okay, I totally understand, but I sure hope you keep your mind. You don't go, seriously, dude, you know. You don't be mean at all, ever, 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 because you never know when they're gonna wanna come back to you, especially after they have a bad experience with the other ones. <laughs> you want them to go, you know, I really would rather go with this person. So I'm always thinking in my emails, you never, ever, ever put anything in email that you wouldn't want broadcast everywhere to everyone. So you always, always stay nice in your emails. <laughs> you know, always be gracious. Always, because I have seen more stuff come undone just because some idiot will write something in their email just because they're really mad and they're, they're calling them on it because they did that. But you just, that, that language, that body language, or not the body, um, just the, the, you can't really, you can't pick up on the body language when you're um, reading an email. And so you, you sometimes don't pick up stuff. So just always be gracious in your emails, okay? Um, I'll come back over here for just a, okay. All right. Okay, so people. 
Second, a very close second, but, but to me it is a second, and, and maybe I don't necessarily order these, but, but I think it does flow in, is passion. You could tell I was passionate about what I do, right? Um, and I didn't realize just how important that was until I actually found it. <laughs> and I realized I really wasn't that passionate about what I did with ESPN. Um, it was cool and all, and I got to go to some cool things, but I spent most of the time just being really nervous <laughs> about, we're going live, we're going live, and there's just chaos and nerves and tons of stress all the time. And I didn't feel like what I was doing was that noble. I spent eight years on college football sidelines. Yeah, that was fun. Big Ten, Michigan, Ohio State, everything, college game day and stuff. Eight years on the sidelines. It's like watching life for eight years on the sidelines. Everybody else is doing stuff. I'm reporting on the sprained ankle <laughs> or what I heard, you know, behind the, the bench as I'm walking through and the defensive coordinator's chewing out his, his team. Um, so, Passion is really, really key for being able to make some stuff happen. Um, and where did I get this from? You know, people ask me all the time, how'd you get so involved with military? I knew nothing about the military before we got pulled into it. So I came to work for Story Rock as the chief marketing officer. At the time, technology company working with schools and stuff. In 2005, um, we got a call from the commanding general of the 96th Regional Readiness Command, which was based in uh, Fort Douglas at the time. 9,000 soldiers, part of the Army Reserve. It was the largest geographical command in the Army Reserve. And he called us and he says, we need some help. Um, we need help telling our story. We have so much content than we've ever had before. We're taking more pictures, more videos. We have more documents than ever before. We're not doing anything with it. He says, I've got public affairs officers who are always taking pictures. I never see it. What can we do with that? So I had my background in television and in television production, which I'm used to integrating lots of stuff. Video, B-roll, photos, um, stories. I'm used to telling the story. Plus I've got this technology over here that we specialize in the digital content management. And you know, I told him, absolutely, we can, we can do something. Let's, what is it that you want? And I sat down with him for a couple hours and I said, tell me everything that you would want out of this. And so he just told me and it was acronym city. Oh my gosh, I had never, heard all these acronyms before and I had to, you know, he had to explain to me everything because he was just speaking only in acronyms and that took a long time getting through. But finally I realized, okay, he just wants his soldiers to understand what they've accomplished together in order to better understand why they should have camaraderie, not just Yes, you should have it, but here's what we've done together that's so significant. Here are the sacrifices that were made. Um, here, um, this, this is what we can share with our family members on what we've done. So, and he wanted to be able to give them all a copy of this. So that's how it kind of just got started, but I didn't know anything about the military at that point. Um, and the more I, I got to understand that nobody was telling their story, they weren't telling it, Nobody else was telling it, little, little pieces. But when you think about that less than 1% of Americans serve in the military, most of America is largely disconnected from what our military, what they do. Um, and so it became more and more important the more that I learned that we weren't just a vendor for the guys there in Salt Lake City. Nobody else was doing this in the country. So they actually, they introduced us to the Utah National Guard. We did a project for them. Then the Utah National Guard's like, you, you gotta share this with everybody else. Eventually, over the next three years, I'm, I'm back at the Pentagon. That's when I started going back to the Pentagon. About every three or four weeks for the last 10 years, I've been going back to the Pentagon. And I have met some amazing, great, great Americans. I remember when I went to um, Iraq and we were, so I got to go in and, and just go on a handshake tour. And I remember the first time that they, we, we flew into Kuwait first and then from there, um, we were taking a C-17, which carries, I don't know, how much? Well, a ton. They take, they'll, they'll take tanks and stuff on board. But this time, so we were supposed to meet them at, at 2 a.m. on the tarmac, because that's a great time to fly into combat, I guess. <laughs> it was about a four hour flight to get to Iraq from Kuwait. And so we met them on the tarmac and we were the first ones on the plane and we got into this huge plane and there were seats on the side, the bucket seats, and then right in the middle they had, oh, I think it was about 
eight across seats going all the way back, about 150 seats, just right in the middle. So I didn't know who was getting on, but we got on first and I thought, well, I guess you're supposed to just sit wherever. So I started walking into one of the seats and into one of the rows and I went, oh my gosh, you can't even sit down in here. I guess maybe they'll all lay down, but there was no knee, I mean, even I'm 5'8", but my knees were just right up against the back of the seat. I thought, this is terrible. And so I was going to just kind of sit and maybe take a couple of seats. And then the, one of the officers got on and he says, oh, no, ma'am, you're going to go sit here on, on the bucket side. The soldiers are going to be sitting here. And I went, how many soldiers do you have? Because they're not going to fit in here. And they said, oh, every seat will be taken, 150. And I'm going, they're a lot bigger than I am. How are they going to fit in this thing for a four-hour flight? So we sit down. Sure enough, they all file in, 150 soldiers all file in. Not only just, you know, just filing in, but they're carrying 80-pound backpacks. Where do these backpacks go? There's no overhead. They go on their laps for a four-hour flight. Not one of them complains. They just file right in, and they sit on this with their backpacks on their laps for this four-hour, five-hour flight into Iraq. And I remember just watching them, and we started talking to them, and a lot of them had pictures of their family inside their helmets, so they're taking off their helmets and showing us. And uh, one of them had a cute little teddy bear. He had missed his, he had a three-year-old son, and so he had this teddy bear um, clipped onto his, his backpack and stuff. And I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, the discomfort that they go through, that's the least of their issues, the discomfort they go through just to, to serve on our behalf. This is an all-volunteer force. The last time that we had the draft was Vietnam. So they serve in our behalf, all volunteer. Another huge big moment for me was, um, so I was in Iraq in 2009, and on Easter Sunday, um, it was early in the morning, and the, uh, the colonel of this forward operating base that, uh, where we were staying for just that one night, he had asked us if we wanted to join some of the soldiers to go with them into Balad to a school and where they were meeting on Sunday, um, where a bunch, it was an all girls school where they were going to be handing out school supplies. And I said, oh my gosh, yes, I would love to. So we had to get in our Kevlar and they gave us helmets and everything, which did not fit and I looked really funny. Um, but we got into, they had a four, um, four MRAP convoy. An MRAP is about 18 feet tall. It's bigger, much bigger than a Humvee. Um, but those are the ones that have, um, that they started uh, deploying in, I wanna say 2000, Eight. They're a V-hold craft that helps deflect the IEDs. Um, so we were in, in these MRAPs as we're going outside um, the base. And, but before we got into that, they did this little briefing. And um, this guy, we're all kind of standing around, and, and this soldier says, um, and he showed his big map, and he says, okay, this was the route we were going to go on, uh, but there was an IED blast there, so we're not going to go that route. We're going to go this other route. I didn't think anything of it. Um, went ahead, we went to the school, it was amazing, met with these 200 little Iraqi girls who were just throwing their arms around us saying, I love you and thank you, and that was an eye opener. I had no idea, for some reason, I thought, based on what I saw in the news, that Iraq wanted to kick us out. Not from what I saw there, I mean, these, they were amazed, the families were there, uh, the mayor of Balad came and, and just, I mean, it was unbelievable. Anyway, the next morning, we had flown out and we were going to the um, Air Force Base Ramstein in Germany. And we were stopping there because of the Landstuhl Trauma Center, which is where they take the soldiers immediately from the battlefield, take them directly to Landstuhl. Within hours, they're there. And then from there, they stabilize them and then get them over to the US. So within almost hours, um, they are typically already in the United States. So we stopped into Landstuhl. Hang on. Oh my goodness, I gotta go really fast. Okay, I'm gonna cut this story really short. Um, so we um, were there in launch duel. There was a lot of activity in this one room that we were gonna go see. And, and the doctor had come out and he stood right next to me and he said, there's a soldier in there who just lost all four limbs. And his parents had just arrived and they were, his parents were going in. And, and he explained to me that this had happened Easter Sunday morning. And I said, really, where? And he says, just outside Balad. And the more I found out, I went, oh my gosh, that was on the route that I was going to be on. And I stayed in touch with his parents. When he got to Walter Reed, six weeks later, I was at Walter Reed and watched him as he was in physical therapy, still alive, in physical therapy with his bandaged arms, 
with these cutoff arms right here and doing, um, he, was, he was practicing being able to move a mouse uh, um, and uh, just to see some computer movements and stuff. And two, two months later, I went back and took him and his brother to dinner. He was already, to, he had prosthetics and everything and he wanted to practice holding a hamburger with his prosthetic hand. And last year, no, yeah, two years ago, he was the first person to receive a double arm transplant. How cool was that to see him at the press conference? I remember seeing him, here was the table, his new arms were like this. And um, so they were asking him about his arms and he says, you know, it's just been really amazing and he did that. And I just went, oh my gosh. <laughs> but you know what he said to me? Um, when I was explaining to him, I said, do you know why, do you remember why I'm so interested in you? His name is Brendan Morocco. And he says, no, I don't remember. And, and I said, because you were on the route that I was going to be on. And he looked at me and he says, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and I see that time and time and time again with these, with the wounded warriors, with everybody. I mean, so that's where I get my passion from because I see them so much and I see what great Americans they are and that their story is not being told. So that's, and the more passion that you have, here's my third one, you're able to be persistent. Persistent and patient. When you know that what you're doing is important, and trust me, anytime you're doing anything important, it's gonna be hard, okay? The easy stuff is probably not gonna be so important. So when you're doing important things, it's gonna be hard and it's gonna be long and it's gonna take a long time. Um, so I'm gonna tell you something. Back in 08, no, let's see, 2010, 2010, Congress was going through and it had taken me two years two years to work on these two major contracts, one with the reserve component that covers all seven, the um, Army National Guard, um, Air Force National Guard, anyway, all seven of the reserve components. It was a $4 million contract, taking me two years to get to that point, all the way through the Pentagon where they were all excited, it was a $4 million thing, and $4 million with the National Guard, that we were gonna do another big contract with them. We had already done one, we had worked with half the National Guard, and it was going great to help preserve their history. So. I get that ready two years at, I think it was 11.30 at night, Congress is signing some bills and I can't even remember who it was, I was so mad. Um, but somebody, Senate Majority Leader, signed um, or vetoed or something the, the um, omnibus bill that killed all of those earmarks. And back in those days, earmarks, so this four years ago, earmarks were how programs got established. It wasn't just frivolous stuff, there were a few things here and there, but that was the expected protocol to get through a pro, if you want a program, you first need to prove that it can get through a couple years of earmarks. So in one fell swoop, in a minute, I saw $8 million go totally away. For a little company in Utah, that's devastating. That is completely devastating. That means that I gotta let people go. I mean, it's really hard. And I thought long and hard about closing our doors. And it was because of, of a couple of general officers that I had gotten to know who said, you cannot quit. What you're doing is too important. And I said, I know, but look at what just happened. And he says, that doesn't mean that it's not needed and not wanted. You have to figure out a different way. So that leads me to, okay, so there's persistent and patient. So I've been doing this 10 years. <laughs> but what happens is, you're able to pivot. You always have to pivot. There's always a different way of doing something. D never just go, well, there's only one way. To me, yeah, I was thinking I get that contract. It's signed. I've got now the Army Reserve and all these reserve components that want to do this. I got the National Guard that's ready to go. I got them all lined up and it fell through. Now what? So you pivot and you get creative and you do different things. And one of the things that I found was, you know what? Okay, so now we're in an era of continuing resolutions and sequestration where there's downsizing and money is not as plentiful as it used to be in the, in the uh, heart of the war years. And now everything's drawing down. Okay, so what am I gonna do? Guess what? I started working on the sponsorship model and I went out to the community sponsors and community sponsors want to do things for our soldiers. So we have, really refined and developed the whole sponsorship model and that's what has led to our Vietnam 50th commemoration thing. Yes, there's gonna be some state funding, but for the most part, it's private sector sponsorship funding. They want a way to say thank you and I discovered that and we were able to pull it in. The last big project we did with the Utah National Guard, fully funded, 
fully funded by Miller, um, Larry H. Miller Group, by um, Eccles, and um, Merit Medical, and Mountain America Credit Union. Those four paid for the whole thing so that every service member got to have their history and get their story told. So people, passion, persistence slash patience, um, pivot, and then the last one, trust me, it's, it, it is a word for me. <laughs> Partner up. That's different from alliances. Partner up meaning I'm a little company in Salt Lake, who's gonna pay attention to me? I have to partner up. Do you notice what I told you in the first minute that I was up here? What did I rattle off? All my partners. Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, Veterans of Foreign Wars, Library of Congress, National Association of State Directors of Veterans Affairs, um, Center of Military History, Army, Med Ar Army Histor Historical Foundation. I'm a little company, nobody knows my little brand, RMS Productions, but the associated credibility of the partners up. And how did I do that? The very first thing that I did when I started going back to Washington, DC, I knew that what we had was really important and really valuable. So what I had to do was start to meet people. And I thought, okay, who do I wanna meet? Well, I really wanna meet the Center of Military History and let them know what we're doing. So I, I asked some people, can, can somebody get, and you know, this person knew this person who knew this person who knew the head of the Center of Military History. So I went in to meet with Dr. Stewart and I just told him what we were doing. I didn't expect that he would say, oh, let's sign a contract. I just wanted his blessing, you know? I wanted him to, to tell me what he thought. And he thought, this is really great. So I said, tell you what, can I give you, give you everything that we work on? So when I work on the Army Reserve, when I work on the 3rd Infantry Division, when I work on the 425th SBCT, I want to just give it to you for your archives. And he went, absolutely, sure. Guess what? He's now a partner. I'm submitting everything to him. So then I went to meet with the Library of Congress. I told them what we were doing and they said, oh, that is so great because we have the Veterans History Project. We're trying to get the word out to have more veterans tell their story. And I said, guess what? I work with just units. And people are always saying, well, I want you to tell my story. What I can do is I can help you create awareness to all these people that we're working with in the units. And they said, that's fantastic. How about if we give you Library of Congress bookmarks with your brand on it <laughs> that you can put in each one of these books? And I went, sure, that sounds great. I'm now a partner with the Library of Congress. They sent me 250,000 bookmarks. <laughs> I get to inventory, <laughs> but that's awesome, you know? So partner up. If you're just a little company, you find out who you want to be, the very, very top, who's important for you, and you figure out a way to bring value to them. So all in all, I am, I am so proud of our little company and what we've been able to do. And that's, I guess, the last P. Be proud of what you do. I'm really proud of what we do. And, and honestly, this is the first time in my professional career that I could be, I could be able to say that, that I'm really, really proud of what I do. I do. I've done lots of different kinds of things. And like I said, kind of cool things. But this is the one that I'm really, really proud of. So I'm excited about that. Okay, so we're going to wrap up there, but I'm going to now do some Q&A. So how about if, um, I hope you've been thinking of some questions. Any ideas of any questions you'd like to ask? We've got a few minutes, right? That we can do that? Okay. I answered everything. Oh, right over here. Yes. Yes. Here's what we did. When we were starting to work with the Department of Defense, one of the biggest questions was, how do we distribute this? Are we going to go with a database? Come to find out, both with the Korean War veterans and the Vietnam veterans, nobody has a perfect database. I've even met with um, the Assistant Secretary of uh, Veterans Affairs, who says we have 40% of all veterans. We only have 40% in our database. So you go to anybody, and I'm partnering with all these associations, nobody's got a perfect database. So we went, okay, it's not gonna work to do a database. What we're gonna do is on the honor system. We're going to get the word out to everybody. So for the Korean one, we got the word out to working with the Korean War Veterans Association. We worked with every veteran service organization, every state veterans agency, and every National Guard units, because National Guards have armories in every corner of the state, in every state, all the states. So we worked with all of them to have them do um, little events on Veterans Day in their community, and we gave them press releases that they could send out and get the word out and just say, come, we have a gift for you. And anybody that came up and wanted a book and either said, this is for me and all the, all the veterans wear their hats. 
So, I mean, if they're very proud of that, which is great. So they wear their baseball hats with, with their pins and Korean War veteran and stuff. So they would come up or a family member would come up and say, my dad served and he died. And I would like have a copy and would say, sure, here's your copy. And we found out that was an unbelievable, great way of doing it. Um, it was just on the honor system. And you know what? If we were giving out $1,000 gift cards, that wouldn't work. We would have to have a database. But we're giving out a book of their story of their service. It's really only meaningful to them. So we're going to do the same thing with the Vietnam Project. So we're just going to give it out to those on the honor system. Yeah. I have a personal question. Sure. And that is, my father-in-law is a Korean War vet. <gasps> I doubt that he went to any of these events. I will let you keep that. I was going to say, how can I You get to have that because I brought it for you. <laughs> and they're hard to come by now because we ran out of the inventory. So I only have probably 20 at the office now. But they're meant for the Korean War veterans. So I will give it to you. So see me afterwards. Okay. Yes? Um, I was going to ask about your company, Checkout. It's really small. Do you have like a brick and mortar location? How many yes. people work for you? So I have about 15. Um, but we can ramp up. Here's the great thing. Um, it's, it's infinitely scalable. And the reason why is because of my process. So we have 15 people in Salt Lake City. We're just off 21st South. I have some people that live in Highland, some people that live in um, Davis County. So it's a, it's a great place. Um, but for instance, we, we ramped up pretty quickly to about 45 people when I was working on half the National Guard simultaneously. We were working on California and Florida and Oklahoma and New York, and it was some massive projects. But what made it work was that we start when we start with a project, let's say, for instance, we started with the USS America. It's the Navy's newest warship. It's um, about uh, a crew of about 1,800. And so when we start with them, first we do a kickoff with the public affairs officer, whoever's the project officer, and we tell them all the content that we need. We can't do anything until we have content. We need their photos, their videos, their documents, their letters, their awards, their commendations, all that stuff. And we have a project officer assigned to them. And every week they call them and say, how are you doing on that? And we give them eight weeks to do that. Guess what? I can train anybody in eight weeks, right? So I already have visibility on what projects I've got. And all that I need, I need people who have good people skills. Um, I need, uh, usually when I ramp up, then it's in our video department. And we, can free, we do freelancers, a lot of video editor uh, freelancing on that. And... Um, and then sometimes we'll bring on graphic designers extra. So we've got a little team of, of just a couple people that we need in graphic design, but we're able to balance it. But that's the neat thing about our process is that I have two month visibility on that before I need to have, have it totally ramped up. So I could, I had it figured out how I could do the entire Department of Defense all at once. And it wouldn't phrase us, it would be great. Yeah. So you talked about partnering up. How can we partner up and increase our Okay, you, probably have already done your homework on who would you like to meet or what company would be, what could you bring the most value to and why? And if you could meet them, you know, what would you, what would you tell them? Um, I'm not, I'm not lying. It's hard. Um, but you make your list, you know, of what companies and, and you go for it. You know, it might mean, you know, if you need to meet somebody in New York, you go to New York and you show up on their doorstep. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the old fashioned way. It really is. It's being obnoxious. In fact, so one of, some of my, my favorite compliments that I've received is that I'm a battering ram and I'm a pit bull. <laughs> and I was called that by two general officers who I've worked with and then they smile. And it's like, great, that's fine. I'm a battering ram, that's okay. <laughs> so you just, you have to be, one of my favorite words, indefatigable. Okay, you have to be that way. You have to, you, there, there's no room for just getting tired and giving up. When, when you really believe in something, it's gonna be hard. But yeah, just make your list. Say that's who I wanna get to eventually. Okay, what else? Yes? Your decision to go with the printed book, <laughs> what helped shape that decision? Because you've increased your complexity by quite a bit. Oh my gosh, yeah. We were a technology company, now we're in publishing. <laughs> the reason why is that here I was going along um, trying to get everybody, the Army and everybody to do this uh, with, the, with the dual layer DVD-ROM, which I loved, really, 10,000 digital pages I could put on there with, um, with hours of video content. It was, it was just fantastic. What happened is we took it to the Navy. Turns out, so I had, and I had packaged this um, disc in the back of uh, what, we, what we 
We wanted it to look and feel like a book because people like to put it on their shelves and they want to have a little gold foil on it. And so it was about this size and we, we put it in with just a little um, abbreviated version of their history and, uh, and almost like a journal. And then we put it in there and that was, that was their thing with their, their, I should have brought something in their 3rd Infantry Division, 419 Transportation Company. It was really cool in the dates. But we took it to the Navy and they said, the technology is really cool. We love the whole interactive stuff. But the book, we really need the big book. And we found out they had been doing for a hundred years. They've done every single deployment. They do what's called a cruise book. Looks like a yearbook, like a high school yearbook, but it is a big, thick book. Sometimes they're that big. They've got fi the, the aircraft carriers, 500 pages. So you can imagine they're really expensive. Um, but we said, okay, so this is where we change on a dime. This is where we pivot. We're a technology company. Guess what? We're now in publishing. <laughs> so I, I went out to the Navy and I said, Okay, so if I do a book for you, will you do this? And they said, absolutely. So I told my graphic designer, guess what? You're now doing a layout for a book. <laughs> I said, okay. And that first one, man, what was the first one? Oh, I should have brought it. But now our books are, in fact, we do all the layout for them. All the other, our competition, they don't do the layout. We've built it into the pricing. We've been able to get it down really, really low. But our competition, they're just printers. So the poor sailor has to figure out how to do a layout. And it's like, this isn't why I joined the Navy. I got to do this layout thing for this thing. And so we get to go to them and say, you don't have to do that. Put it on us. Just get us the stuff and we'll create it for you. But yeah, so now we're in publishing. <laughs> it's weird. It's just weird how it happens. But we tell the story. That's our job is to tell the story. Okay, what else? Any other questions? Yeah. But do you see people on the FBN that you used to work with? Every now and then, do I see people that I used to work with at ESPN? Um, every now and then, I'm still really good friends with one of my producers. Uh, he started running ESPN3. Um, and so we've just kind of stayed in touch. I saw him like last year, but I'm, I'm hardly ever back east. Oh, when College Game Day came out to uh, BYU, I want to say two years ago. Um, so Chris Fowler. Is a, is a good friend, and Lee Corso is a good friend, and so I got to see them when they came out. Um, uh, Kirk Herbstreet, I actually interviewed him when he was a player, um, so that was pretty cool. So those of you guys who watch uh, College Game Day. So every now and then, but not too often, I, I really, most of them have, have left. So, yeah. Anything else? I'm missing anything else? Okay, is that it? All right, thank you very much for allowing me to come. It was great to be with you guys. <laughs> okay.